Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is lecture number seven of the Cricket South Africa Level 1 umpiring course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp and my co-presenter for the evening will be Tom Mokarosi. In the previous six lectures, we've, uh, we've covered uh, laws 1 to 40 and in some of the tech or some of the slides there were text highlighted uh, um, in okay. there were text highlighted in in green send mom a message ask her when she's going to be here. um can you please uh, mute your your microphones thank you so much and in some of the the slides there were text highlighted in green and those uh, text highlighted in green, there are exam questions on them. So in tonight's revision lecture, I will only cover those slides that contains those green highlighted text. So under law one, under the players, the first bit of green highlighted text was in in most of the matches across the world, a game of cricket is played between uh, 11 players, but the law allows in certain matches, uh, typically um, trial games, that uh, the game can be played between sides of more than or even fewer than 11 players. Okay, but if you do play with more than 11 players, no more than 11 players may be on the field at any time. In terms of the nomination and the replacement of players, each captain needs to nominate his or her players in writing to one of the umpires before the toss. So once the toss has taken place, no player may be changed without the consent of the opposing captain. So once the toss has taken place, and let's say the teams are still busy warming up before the game has started, a player gets injured, and that player wants, um, needs to be changed, let's say he broke his ankle. Yes, the law allows that player to be changed, but you need the consent of the opposing captain. If the captain say yes, you're then allowed to change that injured player. If the opposing captain say no, you are not allowed. Just only the opposing captain to either say yes or no. When it comes to the umpires, the umpires needs to be at the ground at least 45 minutes before the start of each day's play. Why 45 minutes? As per the law, 45 minutes. There are many competitions that maybe has 60 minutes or 90 minutes, but according to the law, at least 45 minutes before play starts, there are lots of duties that the umpire needs to perform, hence the need to be there 45 minutes before play starts. Are you allowed to change an umpire after the game has started? Yes, the law allows it. The law allows an umpire to be changed if that umpire became injured or ill. But the law tells us that the replacement umpire to only stand as the strikers in umpire unless both captains agree that this replacement umpire can take full responsibility as an umpire in this particular game. So yes, you're allowed to change, but that the new umpire can only be strikers in unless both captains agree. Then that the replacement umpire can then have full responsibility as an umpire in this particular game. Fair and unfair play. Umpires are the sole judges of fair and unfair play. 
fitness of play. It is solely for the umpires together to decide whether either ground, weather or light or even exceptional circumstances means that it would be dangerous or unreasonable for play to take place. And again, when it comes to fitness of the of the ground or whether it's weather or light, umpires alone decide, not captains, nor coaches, umpires alone. And the two criteria that they need to take into account is whether the conditions are dangerous or unreasonable. So what happens if the umpires now decided to suspend play? The law, uh, the law tells us that when it comes to the deciding if one umpire, if one umpire decided that conditions has become dangerous or unreasonable, play needs to be suspended immediately. Example of this, you play is in progress and it's getting a bit dark. Um, umpires look at each other, they show non-verbal communication and they both still happy. Let's say 10 minutes later, they look at each other, one umpire say, I think it's a bit too Dog, the other umpire say, I think it's still good to play on. If there's a disagreement, or you need to display, uh, so uh, play needs to be suspended immediately. When it comes to the position of the umpires, the law tells us that usually the strikers in umpire needs to stand on the leg side or on the on side of uh, the pitch. But the law allows on the opposite side or on the off side of the pitch. An example of this, uh, the low setting sun, or there's maybe lots of fielders standing on the on side, uh, blocking the umpire's view of the popping crease or of the of the the wickets the law allows the uh, the strikers in umpire to go stand on the offside but upon deciding to go stand on the offside the strikers in umpire needs to inform the captain of the fielding side the striker and the other umpire so captain of the fielding side striker and the umpire these are the three individuals that the strikers in umpire needs to inform if they do decide to stand on the offside. Scorers. The law tells us that for each game, two scorers needs to be appointed. And what are their duties? Scorers, they record all runs. They need to record all wickets that were taken and they need to record all the numbers, number of overs that are bowled in the match. That These three duties are for the scorers in each game. Again, I'm only focusing on the green highlighted text. When it comes to the ball, the question in the exam is, in a match of more than one day's duration, let's say a five-day test match, the captain of the fielding side is allowed the option to take a new ball after how many overs? After 80 overs has been bowled. So the option is there. After 80 overs in the first innings has been bowled, the captain of the fielding side has the option to either take a new ball or not. The option is there if the captain decides to continue playing with the or the old ball or the current ball, no issue. The captain can continue to play. But after 80 overs, the option is there to take a new ball. The bat, when it comes to the overall length of the bat, all the law tell us that the bat should not be more than 96.52 centimeters in length. 
when it comes to the length, only thing the law tells us is the bat not to be more than 96.52 centimeters. The creases. There are three creases. Firstly, there's the popping crease, which is this front line. There are two return creases, and there is the bowling crease. So I can, this is, I'm giving you three points in the exam. They are, they will ask you, I will give you Give you a diagram and they'll uh, they'll give you a number on the diagram and you, you need to name those creases. So the one is popping, the other the two return creases and the bowling crease. So just to confirm again, if you look if you look at uh, the picture on the right hand side where they do name the creases, so the front one is the popping crease. The one where the stumps are pitched in, they, uh, that's the bowling crease, and there are two return creases. Measurements will also be examined in the exam, so make sure that you do know your measurements. So what are the, me the measurements? When it comes to the measurement from the bowling crease to, to the popping crease, so from the back edge of the bowling crease to the back edge of the popping crease, that measurement in meters is 1.22 meters. Uh, that's the metric system. The imperial system is four feet. Both are accepted in the exam. Uh, for me, just the metric system is much easier. Comes to the return crease. Turn creases are minimum 2.4 four meters. All the law tells us is it needs to be a minimum of 2.44 meters. The return crease can go up until the, the boundary edge, but all the law tells us is just the minimum 2.44 meters. The pop increase. Minimum length of 3.66 meters minimum 3.66. It can go right up until the boundary, uh, but all the lower tellers, pop increase needs to be a minimum of 3.66 uh, meters. And the bowling crease measurement, 2.64 meters, and it's from the inside edge of the return crease till the inside edge of the return crease on the other side. For me, an easy uh, method to remember these uh, measurements, all I, all I remember is uh, the measurement from the back edge of the bowling crease till the back edge of the popping crease, that is 1.22 meters. If I times or multiply that by 2, 1.22 multiplied by 2 is 2.44 meters. And what is that? That is the minimum length of the return crease. And if I take 1.22 and I multiply it by 3, I get 3.66 meters, and that is the minimum length of the pop increase. And just to confirm, pop increase is 2.64 meters. An exam tip, what you need to look out for in the diagram in the exam, look at the, uh, the arrows in the the exams so you'll get a diagram and when they ask you about the measurements look at the uh, arrows and what i mean by look at the arrows see where the arrow starts and where the arrow uh, ends like if you look at the measurement for the bowling increase if the arrow starts at the back uh, inside edge of the return crease and it ends at the inside edge of the return crease on the other side, they are looking for the full measurement of the bowling crease, which is 2.64 meters. But if the arrow is, let's say, starts at the inside edge of the return crease and the arrow stops at the middle stump, 
then what they're looking for is they're not looking for the full measurement. They're not looking for 2.64 meters. They're only looking for half that measurement, which is 1.32 meters. Similarly to any of the other lines, let's say um, the, the pop increase. Minimum length of the pop increase is 3.66 meters. Again, look at the arrows. If the arrows only ask you for half of the, the pop increase, um, you, uh, you need to give only half of the measurement of the pop increase. That is just an exam tip. Look at the arrows, where they start and where they end. Law nine, preparation and maintenance of the playing area. The timing of the mowing of the pits. So mowing of the pits needs to be completed not later than 30 minutes before play is about to start. So if play starts at 10 o'clock, by 9.30, mowing needs to be completed. So whether you, whether you mow at 10 past 9 or 9.15 or 9.20 for a 10 o'clock start, or the law tell us 30 minutes before play is about to start. So in my example, by 9.30, mowing needs to be completed. Rolling of the bits. So now the game has started. So are you allowed to roll the bits? And when are you allowed to roll the bits? The law tell us that after the game has started, now you're only allowed to roll the bits before the start of each innings and before the start of each subsequent day's play. So in a five-day uh, test match, at the start of, uh, before the start of day two, the pitch may be rolled. Before the start of day three, pitch may be rolled. Similarly, day, day four and day five. So that's the first instance where a pitch um, um, is allowed to be rolled once the game has started. The second instance is before the start of each inning. So once a team gets uh, dismissed or a team declares or a team forfeits and... Um, uh, and it is, and the other side needs to go bat. They, the um, captain of that now batting side has the option to roll the innings. So now we know when, before the start of each innings and before the start of each subsequent day's play. So how long must the speech be rolled? All the law tell us, not more than seven minutes. So yes, if the captain wants to roll five minutes, no problem. Six minutes, no problem. One minute, no issue. 30 seconds is allowed. All the law tell us, not more than seven minutes. And again, this is an option to the batting captain at the time. If the cap batting captain does not want any rolling to be done, uh, no issue. That is his or her prerogative to, um, to take the option to roll or not. And... The batting captain can also decide if there are more than one roller available, which roller to take. So the batting captain will tell you, yes, I want rolling. Can I, may I please have the heavy roller or the big roller? And can I have it rolled for five minutes or seven minutes? Intervals. What, what do the law classify as scheduled intervals? Firstly, Period between close of play on one day and the start of the next day's play, that is classified as a scheduled interval. Interval between innings, interval for meals, interval for drinks, and any other agreed intervals. So these are five instances as per the law of scheduled intervals. When it comes to the duration of the intervals, and the exam question will focus on the interval between innings. The law tell us how long shall the interval between innings be? 10 minutes. Law also tell us that if an innings ends when 10 minutes or less 
remains before the agreed close of play on any day. That will be stumps for that day. No further play shall take place. So let's say our close of play is six o'clock. So 1800 hours is our close of play. At 1751, side A gets bowled out. And because this is with, uh, within 10 minutes or less to the agreed time for close of play, which is six o'clock in our example, so 1751 side A um, was bowled out. That will be stumps for that particular day. So no further play on that particular day. Yes, we did in uh, nine minutes earlier on, on, on that particular day, but the Lord tell us the following day, no, um, you will start on time. Let's say it's a 10 o'clock start. You will start on time at 10 o'clock. You will not start nine minutes earlier. So are you allowed to change your time for tea? Yes, the law allows us. The law tells us that. If a side gets bowled out, or for innings ends, where the side declares or gets bowled out, when 30 minutes or less remains before the agreed time of, for, for T, the T interval shall be taken immediately. So let's say T is 3 o'clock. If side A gets bowled out at 14.30 or later, T will be taken immediately. And T is usually 20 minutes duration. So if side A gets bowled out at 14.30, and this is 30 minutes or less before the agreed time of T of 3 o'clock in our example, T will be taken immediately. T will be 20 minutes. It will be from 14.30 till 14.50. What happens if a side is nine wickets down at the lunch or the tea interval. So just to save a bit of time, the law allows us that if a side is nine down, and it can be whether it's lunch or the tea interval, the law allows us to play for a further 30 minutes unless the side gets bowled out. So an example just to illustrate uh, what the laws are trying to tell us. Lunch is at 12 o'clock. And, uh, and remember, same principle applied to tea. I'll only use lunch as an example. So lunch starts at, lunch is at 12 o'clock. At 11, at 11.59, uh, side A is, is 200 for nine wickets. Now, the, the final over is uh, 11.50, 11.59 and over starts. So now you get to 12 o'clock and only two balls was bowled. Do you take lunch? No, you don't take lunch. You need to complete the over. But now the law tell us, because the side is nine wickets down, you will not take lunch at the end of this over. Lunch, you will delay the lunch interval by 30 minutes to see if the fielding side can take the 10th wicket. So now, nine wickets down, you won't, you won't take lunch at 12 o'clock. You'll delay it. Let's say the wicket gets taken at, at 12.10. So at 12.10, now the 10th wicket was taken. Now you'll take lunch. Lunch is 40 minutes in test matches. So you will be back. Uh, play will restart after lunch at 12.50. Another example. Now you're nine wickets uh, down um, and you get to 12 o'clock. We've just seen now that you should not be take lunch. You should not take lunch at 12 o'clock. You must extend play by 30 minutes. So now you, you get to 12.30 and the side is still nine wickets down. What do you do now? Now you will take lunch at 12.30 and lunch will be 40 minutes and you will return after lunch at 
So it gives the fielding side, all the laws telling us is fielding side, you have an half an hour to take this wicket. If you don't take it, we'll take lunch at 12.30. If you do take it uh, within that 30 minutes, and so in my example, you take it at 12.30, 12.10, you will then take lunch immediately and lunch will be 40 minutes. When it comes to the interval for drinks, all the law tell us that your drinks interval not to be more than five minutes. So whether it's four minutes, three minutes, two minutes, no issue. Uh, we shall not exceed five minutes. When it comes to the complete, uh, the completion of and over. So the law tell us that if the agreed time for an interval is reached, and this is point number one, if the agreed time for an interval is reached during the over, and the over needs to be completed before the interval is taken. So lunch is at 12 o'clock. At 11.59, you start the over. Now you get to 12. Now you get to 12 o'clock. You've only built two balls. The law tell us, yes, I know you've reached 12 o'clock, but you're not going to take lunch. You will com first complete the over and then take lunch. But there is a but. The law tell us that. If there are less than three minutes remaining before the time for lunch, the interval, the lunch interval, shall be taken immediately if a, either a batter is dismissed or a batter retires or players need to leave the field, whether this occurs during the over or at the end of the over. So just an example to illustrate this point. Lunch is at 12 o'clock. At 11.58, let's say side A is 200 for four wickets. So at 11.58, the fifth wicket gets taken. So what do you do now? It's 11.58, so there are still two minutes to go to lunch. Do you take lunch? Or do you complete the, the, or do you complete the over? Law tell us that. In this instance, you will take lunch immediately. Why? Because point number two tell us if there's less than three minutes remaining before the agreed time for, for the lunch interval and a wicket falls, lunch will be taken immediately. So 11.58 will take, will take lunch. We'll return 40 minutes later, which is at 12.38, we'll have a 40 minute lunch. And if we only bowl two minutes, two balls in the over, the four balls will be completed at the resumption of the lunch. When it comes to the toss, law tell us, let's say who needs to be present. Both captains needs to be present at the toss. It needs to happen on the field of play. I know uh, traditionally, Law, uh, it happens um, on um, right next to the, the, the match pitch, but the law actually tell us it can happen, happen anywhere on the field of play. So captains needs to be there on the field of play in the presence of one or both umpires. So at least one umpire needs to be there, but both captains needs to be there. And not earlier than 30 minutes, nor later than 50 minutes before play is about to start. So if... if just in terms of the timings for the toss, we now know who, who needs to be there. We now know where it needs to happen. The timings, if the game starts at 10 o'clock, so on day one, the toss, the window period for the toss to take place is 9.30, if it's a 10 o'clock start, 9.30 to 9.45. That is your window period for your toss to take place. And so now toss is completed. The law tells us that the captain winning the toss needs to notify the opposing captain immediately of whether of whether he or she is going to bat or field. So it needs to happen immediately. In terms of the follow-on, so in a five-day test match or in a in a two innings match of five days uh, or more, and we know in test match cricket, test, match, uh, test matches um, is over five days. 
if the side that bats first leads by at least 200 runs, the captain of that side will have the option to ask the, uh, cap the other uh, side to follow on. So the lead needs to be at least 200 runs. That is, the, that is if it's a five-day test match. In a two-innings game of shorter duration, let's say a three- or four-day uh, uh, match, now the lead needs to be 150. In a two-day match, the lead needs to be 100. And in a one-day game, the lead needs to be 75. So five-day test match, 200. In a three- or four-day game, the lead needs to be 150. And a two-day match, 100 runs in a one-day game, 75. So when the first day's play uh, is lost, how do you determine what? the the lead needs to be in terms of the follow-on. So the first thing or the first important thing that I want to highlight here is you the first day needs to be lost. It must be the first day. And if the first day is is lost, then you will apply the, or the money, you will apply the, the lead to be in according to the number of days remaining. I'll use an example to illustrate uh, this. So in a five day test match, on day one, it rains the whole of day one. Play was not called on day one. Not a single ball was bowled on day on day one. Now play starts on day two. At 10 o'clock on day two, play starts. So we lost the whole day. So now this in effect is a four-day match. So now what the law is telling us is, because this is now a four-day match, because we lost the whole of day one, and it, because it's a four-day match, when it comes to the follow-on, you now need to follow the four-day lead, which is 100 and 50 runs. Same principle apply to, to, to let's say you, you lose you lose the first three days of a test match. You, day one rains out, not a single ball was built. Day two, not a single ball was built. Day three, not a single ball was built. Day four is you start play at 10 o'clock. So how many, how, many, uh, um, how many days remaining in this test match? Two. So now you'll take the, and the lead for a two-day game is 100. So now your follow-on lead needs to be, for the captain to enforce the follow-on, the lead needs to be 100. But what I want you to take away from this is it needs to, it needs to be, that first day needs to be washed out, not a single ball to be bowled on the first day. It cannot be, let's say, you, you play start in a five-day test match, play start on day one. Day two, two gets rained out. Day three gets rained out. And day four gets rained out. And now you only play on day five. So, yes, this test match will only be for two days, but you cannot apply this law because this law is specific. It must, it can only happen if day one or day, day one was rained out totally. If you get play starts on day one, so in our test five day test match, because play was starts, uh, uh, started on day one, even though we lost day two, day three, day four, this, the lead still will be 200 runs. Captain of the batting side may declare an in innings when the ball is, <coughs> sorry, in terms of the declaration, the captain of the batting side may declare an in innings closed whenever the ball is dead during that innings. When it comes to the over, so when does the over start? And over starts when the bowler starts his or her run-up. The moment the bowler takes his or her first step, that is when the over starts. Or if the bowler has no run-up, when the back foot lands, that is when the over starts. So in terms of the boundary, so when the boundary is marked by a white line, 
the inside edge of the line nearest to the pit, that is where the boundary shall be. The inside edge of the line nearest to the pit. If you look at the diagram, you'll see the inside edge of that line. That is where the boundary is. Inside edge of the picket fence, inside edge of the, the rope. You see the, similarly to the post and the flag. But when it comes to a line or a rope, the inside edge shall be the boundary. When it comes to dead ball, the ball automatically becomes dead when it finally settles in the hands of the wicketkeeper or of the bowler. The ball automatically becomes dead when it finally settles in the hands of the wicketkeeper or the bowler. There are many other instances where the ball automatically becomes dead. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but the highlighted green text is it when finally settled when, it, uh, when it's in the hands of the bowler or the wicketkeeper. When it comes to no ball, so in the exam, they will mostly focus on the feet. So you now need to know how to apply the, um, the no ball law when it comes to the feet. So when it comes to the back foot, which crease do you look at? Back foot, the return crease. That is where you need to look at. When it comes to the front foot, there you look at the popping crease. So the law tells us when it comes to the back foot, the back foot shall not touch the return crease. When it comes to the front foot, the front foot must land with some part of the foot where the grounded or raised behind the popping crease or on the same side of the imaginary line joining the two middle stumps. So front foot land some part of the foot grounded or raised behind the return the, behind the popping crease. Let's look at a few uh, pictures. We start with the front foot. Which line is associated with the front foot? The popping crease. Now looking at the popping crease, this is the right hand bowler bowling over the wicket. So so at the front foot is the any part of the front foot with the ground to raise behind the popping crease? Yes, so we're happy with the front foot. Back foot. Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? Yes. So this will be a no ball. Back foot touching the return crease. Let's start with the front foot. Any part of the front foot grounded to raise behind the popping crease? Yes. Back foot. Any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, there's no part of the back foot touching the return crease. That's why we're happy that this is a fair delivery. Let's start with the back foot here. This is a left arm bowler bowling around the wicket. Any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, we're happy with the, with the back foot. Front foot. Any part of the front foot where the ground or to raised behind the popping crease? Yes, there's a big part of the front foot behind the popping crease. That's why this will be a fair delivery. Start with the front foot. Left arm bowler around the wicket. Any part of the front foot grounded to raise behind the popping crease? Yes, we're happy with the front foot. Back foot, any part of the back foot touching the return crease? Yes, that's why this is a no ball. Back foot, we're happy, not touching the return crease. Is there any part of the front foot where the grounded or raised behind the back edge of the popping crease? So when it comes to judging, you need to judge the back edge and not the front edge of that popping crease. There needs to be a portion behind the 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 back edge of the popping crease. So yes, there is a part of the foot behind the popping crease. That's why we're happy that this is a fair delivery. Back foot, not touching the return crease, we're happy. Front foot, any part of the front foot with the ground to raise behind the back edge of the popping crease? No, there's not. So this will be a no ball. Important point that I want to emphasize here is you need to judge upon first landing. So that is where you where you need to judge. Once that the 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 yield lands or that that the front foot lands, that is where you judge it. And don't judge it where it ends up because there are times where a, a, a bowler will land behind the return crease, uh, sorry, behind the popping crease, and that front foot will then slide to over the popping crease. You do not judge it where it ends up. You need to judge it 
when it first lands. And if it first lands behind the pop, be, be, behind the um, pop increase and then slides over, that will be a fair delivery. But in this case, let's assume this is first landing. And upon first landing, because there's no part of the front foot where the ground to race behind the, pop, behind the back edge of the pop increase, that is why this is a no ball. Back foot, we're happy. Same with front foot. Let's assume this is first landing and way over. So this will be a no ball again. Judge it when it first lands. Do not judge it where it ends up. So if this was first landing, we're happy that this is a no ball. Back foot, we're happy. Not touching the return crease. Front foot, yeah, the front foot is raised. But what do we ask yourself? The law tell us whether grounded or raised there should be some part of the of the foot behind the back edge of the pop increase and yes there is some part behind the back edge of the pop increase that's why this is a fair delivery in this instance if you look at the front foot upon first landing there's no part of the foot whether grounded or raised behind the back edge of the pop increase that's why this is a no ball so what happens if a ball bounces more than once or it rolls along the ground? The law tells us that either umpire shall call and signal uh, no ball if the ball bounces more than once or rolls along the ground before reaching the pop increase. So if it bounces more than once, if it bounces a second time before reaching the pop increase, law tell us that either umpire to call and signal no ball. Although the strikers in umpire will be in the best position to, to, to call this, either umpire can call it, but strikers in is in the best position. So bounces more than once before reaching the pop increase, call and signal no ball. Calling and signaling of a wide. So if the umpire judges the delivery to be uh, wide, the umpire only to call and signal wide ball as soon as the ball passes the striker's wicket. Do not call it too early. Wait for the ball to pass the striker's wicket, then to call and signal wide ball. However, or even though we wait till it passes, we, we only wait till it passes the striker's wicket. The law tell us that the ball act is actually considered to, to have been wide from the instant that the bowler entered his or her delivery stride. So in effect, once that back foot has landed from the bowler, that is when the ball is already wide. Even though you, you only call it once it passes the striker's wicket. How can you be dismissed of a white? You'll see it's now in green, so there is an exam question on this. And there are four ways to be dismissed of a white. Hit wicket is one. The second way to be dismissed of a white, obstructing the field. Thirdly, run out. And lastly, you can be stumped off a white. Law 24 covers substitutes and fielder's absence. They start with substitutes. So when will you allow a substitute? The umpire shall allow, shall allow a substitute if that particular fielder became injured or ill, and this happened during the match. So injured or ill, and it happened during the game, umpires to allow a substitute fielder. And umpires also allowing a substitute fielder for a wholly acceptable uh, reason. An, an example of this, uh, you'll find students writing a, a, a test match, a, a, a test or exam um, on a Saturday morning, let's say from 9 till, till 12, they'll only get to the ground at half past 12. That is a wholly acceptable reason why that particular fielder is not at the ground. So in that case, you will allow a substitute fielder. So fielder absent or if a fielder leaves the field of play. The law tell us, yes, if a fielder comes to you and, and inform you that uh, umpire, 
um, I would like to leave the field. You'll ask the fielder, why are you leaving? Let's say the fielder tells you, um, I've, uh, I've, I've uh, injured my, my hamstring. I would like to go off uh, for treatment. No problem. You'll allow the, the fielder to leave the field. You'll allow a substitute fielder uh, to, come, uh, to come on. Uh, but law tell us uh, that that fielder shall not be allowed to bowl until you see has been back for the same amount of time that the fielder was off the field up to a max of 90 minutes. So just to use an example, just to illustrate what the law is trying to tell us. So if a fielder comes to you saying the fielder is injured his, uh, his or hamstring, no problem, we're not, we're not doctors, we'll say no problem, you can go off, we'll allow a substitute. But if that fielder leaves the uh, field of play, let's say at 10.30, and that fielder only comes back at 11 o'clock, can that fielder bowl immediately upon arriving at 11 o'clock? No, the law say no. That fielder needs to be on the field for that same amount of time that he was off the field. So he 10 30 left back at 11, that's half an hour. So that fielder can only bowl at 11 30 because 11 30 would have been on the field for 30 minutes. So that fielder would have served his or her penalty time. But there's a max of 90 minutes here. So example of this fielder goes off at 10 30 and, and only returns at, let's say, the three three o'clock. So the, the field has been off for quite a bit of time. Let's say, um, uh, I do quick, uh, quick maths, let's say that field has been off for uh, 250 minutes. I'm just using a round number. But the law tells us the maximum time or penalty time is only 90 minutes. So even though the fielder was off for three, three and a half hours, the maximum time is 90 minutes. So if that fielder returned at three o'clock, the fielder can bowl again at 16.30. Penalty time does not disappear. So if the player leaves the field before having served all his or her penalty time, balance of that penalty time is carried forward. It's carried forward into the next innings. It's carried forward into the next day. A lot of players think uh, end of the day, uh, game finish at six o'clock, five o'clock. They want to leave the field. They want to put their feet up. They'll think, uh, um, I'll be off an hour today and tomorrow morning I'll have a clean slate. No. If you go off at five and play in at six, that's 60 minutes that you were off. The following morning, if play starts at 10, you're not allowed to bowl immediately. You need to wait that 60 minutes before you're allowed to bowl. So 10 o'clock, so 11 o'clock, that fielder can bowl again. So that penalty done does not disappear. No next day, no next innings. Next game, yes. Yeah, you can't carry penalty time over into, into a, another game, but in the, that same game, it gets carried um, over. If a player leaves the field more than once, let's say the player goes off for um, uh, 30 minutes from 10.30 till 11.00, now the player comes back at 11 and at 10 past 11, the player goes off again for 10, for 10 minutes. So you need to add up all those penalty time that the player was not on the field. So initially the player was off the field for 30 minutes. Then the player was on the field for 10 minutes. So when the player left again, the player owed us 20 minutes. Now the player was off for another 10 minutes. So when the player returned, EOC actually owes us an, another 30 minutes before EOC can bowl again. So, so all point number four is telling us is if they go off more than one and they still owe us penalty time, you add them together. Scheduled intervals does not get added to the penalty time. So it doesn't count for you, nor does it count against you. Against you. So the lunch intervals, the tea intervals, the drinks intervals, those are examples of scheduled intervals. Those, those intervals does not 
carry for uh, um, uh, for the player nor against the player so you cannot add it to his or penalty time nor can you subtract it from his or penalty time so when it comes to penalty time it actually is only the time that the play is off the field of play while play is in progress that is penalty time where if where if there is an interval that's not penalty time if there's a rain interruption that's not it's not seen as penalty time it's only time that while play was in progress that a particular player is not on the field that is seen as as penalty time and i've mentioned this earlier where i said penalty time gets carried into the next the day and gets carried into next innings Timings of the appeals. Appeal is still uh, valid as long as it's done before the bowler delivers the next ball and before time has been called. So the important thing is before the bowler takes that first step to bowl the next ball, that appeal is still valid and time should not have been uh, called. Also, an over does not invalidate an appeal as long as it made before the next, the start of the next over, before that bowler take his or her first step, and provided time has not been called. Almost done. We're going to do a few dismissals laws that are examined. Abdullah, there is no sound on the video. Uh, please unshare and reshare with sound. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Let me let me quickly unshare and then I'll share with sound. Thanks for that, Tom. Fair cat. A catch shall be considered fair if the ball is held in a fielder's hand, hugged to the body of the catcher, or accidentally lodges in his or her clothing, helmet, or protective equipment. But of course, this being cricket, it isn't always that simple. If a fielder deliberately uses an item of clothing to try to catch the ball, it is not out and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side. However, the ball can be caught after it has deflected off the other batsman, an umpire, another fielder, including off a helmet being worn, or even if it lodges in a fielder's helmet. Perhaps the main criterion for a catch to be considered fair is that the ball all must not touch the ground before being caught. Here, for example, the ball does not touch the ground even though the hand holding it does so in affecting the catch. This is a fair catch. And then there is the question of catches near the boundary. This is such an interesting subject that we've given it a film all of its own. To catch up on everything to do with catching, simply refer to Law 33 in the Blue Book. So if a batter gets out caught, how many runs to be scored? No runs to be scored from that particular delivery. Court to take precedence. Last week we heard who is number one. Bold is number one. So if a batter is dismissed, more than one de type of dismissal of the same delivery, and bold is one of them, bold will also be will always be the boss. So bold number one. Who's number two? Court is number two. So if a striker is dismissed, more than one the type of dismissal of the same delivery, and court is one of them, court will be number two. Bold always number one. Court number two. Leg before wicket. Leg before wicket. LBW. Ah! LBW is a little like the offside rule in football. Many people claim to know it, but how many people really do? 
Our handy checklist means that whether you find yourself umpiring an international test match or the kids on the beach, your reputation for fairness will remain intact. There are five basic criteria to consider. The batsman is out, leg before wicket, if one, the bowler bowls a ball that isn't a no ball, unlike this poor fellow, two, the ball, if it is not intercepted on the full, pitches in line between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the batsman's wicket. It cannot be out if the ball pitches outside the line of the leg stump. Three, the ball hits the batsman either full pitch or after pitching and before he hits it with his bat. Four. Ah, this is where it gets a bit more complicated. If the batsman was making a genuine attempt to play the ball, the point of impact must be between wicket and wicket for LBW to be an option. However, if the batsman has made no genuine attempt to play the ball, the contact must either be between wicket and wicket or outside the line of the off stump. Five. This is the crucial part. But for the interception by the batsman, the ball would have gone on to hit the stumps and dislodge the bales. Any questions? Just refer to Law 36 in the Blue Book. So just to confirm again the points that you need to consider when there's an LBW appeal. So when there's an appeal, uh, these uh, six points actually you consider them in a spl split second. And let's go through those points that you consider. Ball not to be a no ball. That ball needs to pitch in line between wicket and wicket or on the off side of the wicket. So the law is clear. Either needs to pitch in line or on the off side. That's why when you hear they say if the ball pitches outside leg can never be out LBW, this is the reason why. The law tell us where it needs to pitch. It, it, it needs it to either pitch in line between the wicket and wicket or on the offside. Ball to not touch the bat first of the batter. If the ball touches the bat first, can never consider the LBW appeal. But if the ball touches or strikes the pad first and then the bat, then you can consider the LBW appeal. But if it touches bat first, immediately uh, say no to the LBW appeal. The ball can be intercepted by any part of the striker's person, whether it's the pad, even though the law say leg before wicket, but it can be the pad, can be the arm, can be, can be the tummy, can be the, the shoulder, any part of the, the striker's person. When it comes to the point of impact, it needs to be either between wicket and wicket, unless there is this big but, the striker did not attempt to play the ball with his or her bat. So the law is quite clear. The impact needs to be, to be between wicket and wicket. There's only one but, and that but is if the striker did not attempt to play the ball with his or her bat, then you can consider, even, the, even if the impact is not between wicket and wicket, if the impact, impact is on the offside or, or, or outside the line or outside off, then you can consider the LBW appeal. But as long as the striker has not made a genuine attempt to play at the ball. But if there's a genuine attempt to play at the ball, the impact must between, be between wicket and wicket. And lastly, very important, all these points are important, but last point is very important. In your opinion, the ball would have gone on to hit the wicket. We'll quickly go through a few pictures. Where did this, is the right-handed batter, where did it pitch? pitched outside leg stump and we've just heard if it pitches outside leg can never be out LBW. When it comes to LBW appeal first thing we need to consider where did it pitch? Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or on the offside? Yes this one pitched between wicket and wicket. Impact 
was the impact between wicked and wicked? Yes, the impact was between wicked and wicked. What's the last question that you ask yourself? Would it have gone on to eat the stumps? If the answer to that question is yes, give out LBW. If no, not out LBW. That's why this picture, they say this is a candidate because uh, I bet you there are some of you that's thinking, yes, this is out. And there's probably one or two that say, no, I don't think this is out. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch between wicket or, or on the off side of the wicket? Yes, it pitched on the off side of the wicket. Impact. Was the impact between wicket and wicket? No, the impact is not between wicket and wicket. The impact is outside the line or, or, or outside off stump. And for that reason, because the impact is outside the line and the batter is playing a shot, this cannot be out. This should be not out. Where did the ball pitch? Outside off stump. Impact? Outside off stump. But because the striker is not playing a shot, in this instance, you can consider this because the striker is not playing a shot. If the striker was playing a shot at this, you will say not out because outside the line or impact outside off. But because the striker is soldering arms, not offering a shot, you can consider this LBW appeal. But you, but still that last, that last portion of the appeal that you need to consider, would it have gone on to eat the stumps? If your answer to that question is, yes, this would have gone on to eat the stumps, give the striker out LBW. If the answer to that question is no, not out LBW. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch in uh, between wicket and wicket or on the offside? Yes, it pitched between wicket and wicket. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. Last question, would it have gone on to eat the stumps? If the answer to that question is yes, out. If not, if the answer to that question is no, not out. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or on the offside? It pitched between wicket and wicket. Impact, was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact. Would it have gone on to hit the stumps? Looking at where this ball pitched, looking at where it hit. I mean, I'm sure this is the left arm over the wicket uh, bowler. So just the line, that the trajectory of this um, stride forward, uh, uh, in my opinion, this is missing off. Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or on the offside? Yes, it pitched on the offside. Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes. Last question, would it have gone on to hit the stumps? But just looking at where this ball pitched, where the impact is, look how much it, it I'm sure this is a spin bowler, so look how much it spun, better playing forward. Uh, there's still quite a distance to travel, I think. My opinion, my last question is, this would not have gone on to hit the stumps. I think this is missing leg. Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or on the offside? Yes, it pitched on the offside. Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes. Would it have gone on to eat the stumps? I don't think so. Why don't I think so? Just look where it did. It did quite, quite high. I think this is going over the top. Second last law of the evening that I'm covering before handing over to Tom. Stumped. All batsmen fear being stumped, and all wicketkeepers dream of stumping batsmen. So, let's be clear about the law. The only player who can stump a batsman is this fellow, the wicketkeeper. A stumping can take place provided that the ball is not a no ball. You can be stumped off a wide, however. Here, for example, the batsman has moved out of his or her ground to play the ball, but has missed it and has not attempted a run. The wicket is fairly put down by the wicketkeeper without the intervention of another fielder. When all these conditions are met, the batsman will find that he or she has indeed been stumped. It's also okay for the ball to rebound onto the stumps off any part of the wicketkeeper, including his or her protective equipment or helmet. If it is a no ball, the batsman will not be outstumped and is also protected from being run out as long as he or she is not attempting a run. Don't be stumped about stumping. 
Get a copy of the Blue Book and study Law 39. And the last law that I'm covering for the evening is the timeout law. It tells us that once a batter is dismissed, the incoming batter must be ready to receive the ball within three minutes of the dismissal. So from the second that the batter is dismissed, the incoming batter needs to be ready within three minutes. Tom, that's it for my section of the revision um, lecture. I'm now handing over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Abdullah, and good evening to all the candidates. Abdullah has just taken us through the revision slides, which I will share with all of you after this lecture. Please note that not every law and not every slide is examined in the level one Cricket South Africa umpires exam. That is why Abdullah has kindly shrunk the presentation and presented only those slides and videos that will be examined in the Level 1 Cricket South Africa umpiring online exam. So looking at the timetable for the next couple of weeks, this is the order of events that will take place. This evening, we are busy with the lecture that is revision purposes. And also, I will be taking you through a click by click demonstration of how to register for the online exam, how to log in to the online exam, and how to answer questions on the online exam. We will do we will be doing a mock exam, which is the Cricket South Africa introduction to umpiring exam. It's only 25 questions. And we have a limit of 30 minutes in which to complete it. This will give you a good idea as to what type of questions are asked in the level one exam and how to answer them, how to submit your answers. And you'll also see that our result will be displayed on screen immediately after we have submitted all our answers. After tonight, you all know that the lectures were free, but the exam fees are payable on or before Thursday, the 16th of March at 1800 hours South African time. The exam fees are either 300 rands for South Africans or 500 rands or USD $30 if you're not in South Africa. However, a lot of you have taken advantage of our discount which is allowed if you subscribe to our YouTube channel. There is the link to our YouTube channel if you don't yet know it. If you do subscribe to our YouTube channel, I believe that you are not receiving a confirmation email. So all you need to do is you need to take a screenshot of the page that shows that you have subscribed to our YouTube channel and send that screenshot along with your proof of payment to training at wpcua.co.za with your discounted exam fee of either 250 rands or 27 US dollars. So there are different options for payment methods. You can either do a normal electronic funds transfer, an EFT, from your South African bank to our South African bank. And I will give details of all three of these options in the email after the lecture. Or you can, if you are overseas, you can try to use wise.com to also effect a electronic funds transfer from a non-South African bank account into a South African bank account. 
If you have a credit card, the easiest way to make payment is using paypal.com and I will provide that payment link in the email after the lecture. As I mentioned, the closing date for payments is Thursday the 16th of March and I don't receive those payments uh, myself. So you need to send a proof of payment to training at wpcua.co.za, otherwise I won't know that you have paid. You are able to make one payment for multiple exam candidates. So, so if you are paying on behalf of friends, colleagues, your schoolmates or your clubmates, please, when you send the proof of payment for 10 candidates, you need to also send the email addresses of those 10 candidates that the exam link email needs to be sent to on Friday morning. You will notice in my click by click demonstration that each candidate receives a unique exam link email which cannot be forwarded to anybody else. So that is why each candidate needs to submit a unique email address that has not been sent an exam link email before. Um, you will notice that I'm going to be using a new email address that I had to create. Why? Because I cannot send an exam link email to my normal Gmail address because I've sent an exam link email to that Gmail address before. So the system does not allow an exam link email to be sent to an email address more than once. On Friday morning at 7 a.m., I will be sending the exam link email to all the email addresses that I've received proof of payments for. The exam, as you will find out on Friday, has got 69 true or false and multiple choice questions. The exam window period will be from 7 a.m. South African time on Friday the 17th of March when I send the exam link email. It's open for 10 days until Monday the 27th of March at one minute before 7 a.m. In that time, you have up to five attempts to achieve the pass mark of 80%. So out of the 69 questions, you need to get at least 56 of them correct. Note that if you get 55 out of 69, it is a result of 79.8%. And unfortunately, it is not rounded up to 80%. Uh, you will need to attempt your exam again to achieve at least 56 correct answers. Once you have achieved the pass mark of 80% or more, you will not have any more attempts to get over more than 80%. Um, so unfortunately, you cannot improve your mark the first time you pass your exam is the last attempt that you will have. Note that you have 90 minutes to answer those 69 questions, and this is more than enough time. Uh, when I do the exam, it takes me 30 minutes, but obviously I'm used to the material and I am used to the questions. So I think that if you're doing it for the first time, then you should take about an hour to complete the exam. That means also that you have, because it's an open book exam, you have time to research, go through the slides that I'll be sending of the revision, which can help you to pass the exam. Make sure that you read the questions carefully, especially the true or false questions. 
Why? Because there are often double negatives in those true or false questions. So you just need to answer carefully and not rush to select answers. As mentioned earlier, results are instantaneous after you submit your answers and you will be displayed on the screen the percentage that you have achieved. If you have achieved 80% or more, the certificate will be emailed immediately to training at wpcua.co.za. I will be checking that inbox on regular occasions and will forward you your certificate as soon as I get the chance. Please note that if you pass your exam at say 2 a.m. South African time, I will not be awake. I will not send the certificate to you immediately. I will forward it to you when I wake up at 8 a.m. Uh, a few hours later. So please give me up to 12 hours before you um, request your certificate. It should come within those 12 hours of you passing. And then of course, I know a lot of you are interested in joining umpires associations, whether you are in Cape Town, whether you are in Durban, whether you are in Johannesburg, whether you are in Cairo, whether you are in Nairobi, whether you are in Dubai, whether you are in Mumbai, whether you are in uh, Islamabad, whether you are in Utrecht in the Netherlands. We have got contacts as to who the people are that you need to get in touch with to be able to apply to join the umpires association closest to you. So when I send you your certificate a few hours after you have passed, I will ask you if you where you are based and you need to reply if you want the contact details of the Upaz Association closest to you. Uh, you need to tell me where in the world you are based and by Tuesday the 28th of March I will have gathered all of those contact details and will list all of them on one email to everyone who has passed and you can then contact the person closest, the umpires association closest to you and you can join the umpires association. Please note that uh, the level one Cricket South Africa certificate is recognized in all of Africa. It is recognized in the United Arab Emirates. It's recognized in the Netherlands. Uh, we do have challenges in India because all of their umpires associations are full. However, the contacts that we'll give you, that we will give you, will let you know when uh, those associations are accepting membership applications. Okay. Level two will be starting on Saturday, the 1st of April, and it will be all online. The exam will be handwritten, but you can do it remotely as well, and we will invigilate via Microsoft Teams. So you can, from anywhere in the world, join us for level two. And again, you will get a Cricket South Africa certification if you pass. All level one passes will be emailed details of the level two course, including the timetable and the meeting links and the course material on Wednesday, the 29th of March. Um, so please just be patient, wait until the exam window period has closed and then I've collated uh, all the details that I need to collect before sending you all at in one email the level two details on Wednesday the 29th of March for our lecture starting on Saturday the 1st of April. So there are a lot of you on here that are outside of South Africa and are interested in coming to Cape Town to umpire. 
before I go through the click by click demonstration of how to register for our online level one exam, I'm just going to quickly go through the exchange program that is open to anyone around the world to come to Cape Town. You need to pass any one of our umpiring exams, level one, two or three, uh, which you are busy with currently. Uh, when I send out that email on Tuesday, the 28th of March, I will be including a online application to join Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. Now, please don't join or fill in that application until you know that you are coming to Cape Town. OK, so that application is only for those people who live in Cape Town or once you have booked your flights and have confirmed your visit to Cape Town, then you can fill in the online WPCUA membership application form. Uh, when we receive your application form, you will get an email from our secretary mentioning that you have been accepted as a member, and then you can also email our match secretary the dates that you will be visiting Cape Town and he will appoint you to matches accordingly. Note that our season is ending very soon on Wednesday, the 21st of March. Uh, so please, if you are wanting to visit Cape Town to umpire, rather visit from October onwards as the season will start, the new season will start in October and it will run all the way through to the end of March 2024. But there is a three week break between um, just before Christmas, usually on the 17th of December until around the 9th of Jan the following year. Um, accommodation you sort out yourself through Airbnb and you also need to apply for the visa yourself. Please make special note of the bottom line of the slide. Western Province Cricket Umpires Association does not provide any visa accommodation or travel assistance. It is not a paid holiday. You come here by your own means and you get to matches using Uber and you do get paid match fees. There are the match fees but it is not a money making scheme for you to come to South Africa and uh, make millions from umpiring it. You need to consider it as an investment in your umpiring career as Datrum Singer Ray did. And on our uh, YouTube channel, you will have a video of him as an exchange umpire in Cape Town coming from India and he explains all the details from start to finish as to how he got to Cape Town, which matches he umpired in, how much he earned, how much the cost of the accommodation was, the flights and what he needed to do to get his visa. So uh, please for all the answers to your questions about how the exchange program works, if I haven't covered everything, Datrum's interview does. Right, so that is that from a logistics point of view. Uh, now I am going to share my screen to show you a click by click demonstration of what will happen on Friday morning in terms of you receiving the exam link email and what you need to do to register and get started with the exam. I'm just going to log into the correct uh, email account. Apologies, I was logged in earlier and now it's kick me out so I need to sign out of tom.mukorosi at gmail.com and sign into my newly created email account. 
account of Mukorosi Tom at gmail.com. Okay, next. Bear with me while I get to the inbox. And you will note that I generated the exam link email at 621 and it got into my inbox not a minute later. If it doesn't appear in your inbox on Friday morning, please check your spam or junk folders. Uh, some email servers do send it to spam or junk, but mine came through into my inbox, so I will click on it. But before I click on it, note that it is not coming from Tom Mukorosi, it's coming from Umpires Universe Academy. Okay, and it says you have been enrolled in a course and the course is level one umpire examination. So I click on it and this is what it looks like. And a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that they are registered when they receive this email. Uh, you are not registered. This email is a link for you to go and register. So don't click on login because you're not registered yet. You need to click on register. And please note, as mentioned, this link is only valid for 10 days. So that is why I reiterate that the exam window period is from Friday the 17th of March till Monday the 27th of March. Please do not wait until Sunday the 26th of March or even Monday the 27th of March for your first attempt. Uh, it does take a while to log register, log in and start attempting your exam. And if you do it lastminute.com, you will be in a panic and you won't pass. Um, so let's go and register. So when you click on register, you will use the email address that you got the exam link email on. So mukorosi tom at gmail.com and you are creating a password or assigning a password to your account, okay? And of course, the confirmation password needs to be exactly the same as what you've just put in up here. I think I had caps lock on, so I'm just going to type it in again from the start. just got a keyboard issue where some of my buttons don't work or they punch in double. So I'm just going to count the number of characters in each one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that should be correct. You need to agree to the terms of use and then you click on sign up. Very important, if you put in a different email address to which the exam link email was sent, you won't be, you won't get registered, okay? Um, so now it tells me that the user has been created. This means I have registered successfully and there is a confirmation email that has been sent to me and you'll see how quickly that email comes through. Again, if it doesn't come through to your inbox, please check your spam or junk folder. Right, here it is, the confirmation email 
and we need to click on confirm account. Otherwise, we will not be able to log in. So here I'm confirming my account, after which point I will be able to log in. If you miss any of these steps, ladies and gentlemen, you will not be able to log in to your account and you will not be able to answer the exam. Now, I, as I'm talking, I've just remembered that I actually registered myself for the level one exam. I should have registered myself for the introduction to umpiring exam. So uh, bear with me. I'm just going to do that quickly. Um, and I'm going to log in as tommukorosi at gmail.com. This is going to take me to my admin uh, profile where I'll be able to send mokorositom at gmail.com the link for the introduction to umpiring exam. Uh, we obviously can't share the questions for the level one umpiring exam, so I need to enroll Mokorosi Tom at gmail.com to the other exam. Introduction to umpiring exam. So apologies for this. This is not part of your guys process. I will tell you when we're continuing with your guys process. So. I've now been enrolled to introduction to umpiring exam and remember that I have previously registered my account and confirmed it. So now I can log in um, as Mokorosi Tom at gmail.com and I will find that I've been registered to two exams I'm going to take you through one of them. So this is the step after you have registered and confirmed your exam. And unfortunately, we've got an error in the system. Let me try and refresh. There we go. So if you ever get an error in the system, just try and refresh. And thankfully, um, here we have gone straight through to what we should be seeing. The default screen is my courses. So on Friday morning, you will only see level one umpire examination. Um, because I enrolled my new email address to uh, two exams, I'm seeing both level one and introduction to umpiring. So what I do here is I go view course. And now I need to fill in all my details. So remember, all I've done is I have registered my account, then I confirmed my account. Now I've logged in. Now I need to fill in all my details and this is very important the names that you include on here are the names that are going to appear on your cricket south africa level one umpiring certificate so my full name is thomas if i want to i can add my middle name Chobokwani, and then my surname okay these will appear on the certificate. So please don't put in your nickname. Don't put in a middle name. If you don't want your middle name to appear on the certificate, put in the names, the name and surname that you want to appear on the certificate. Uh, date of birth is challenging to um, navigate to if you if you don't know how so 
if you try and do this, you're going to be going through months by month. But if you click on the actual month itself, uh, sorry, if you go to hover over the year, then you can scroll down to your year of birth. I am quite long in the teeth nowadays, so I go all the way to 1981, February the 9th, and there is my date of birth. Uh, race. Pretty clear African colored, Indian, white or other. I think other is for mixed race. Um, I am African and my gender is male. My city is Cape Town. And uh, province, only provinces in South Africa appear. Uh, if you're not in South Africa, uh, please use Western Cape, which is where we are in. Uh, but you don't have to add a fictitious city or a wrong city. You can use your city if you want. If you're in Mumbai, you can put in Mumbai. OK, uh, but the province is in a drop down menu, so you need to select Western Cape if you are not in South Africa. If you are anywhere else in South Africa, you can choose where exactly you are. Um, so I'm going to put in Cape Town and Western Cape. Later on, there is a place where all of us, regardless of where you are, you need to put in the association as Western Province Cricket Umpires Association to make sure that the certificate is emailed to training at wpcua.co.za. I'll explain that in more detail when we get to that screen. So save changes. And please don't click more than once. You, you will see up top that the website is working in the background. Um, so you don't need to click save changes again. Just be patient, especially if you are on load shedding and you're using uh, data and the towers are quite weak in their signal, then your internet connection will be slow, just as mine is this evening. Once we have saved our changes, then we can go to my courses. And then click on the picture, not view course anymore, but click on the picture. And then we are able to take test. OK. You will not be able to get to the screen if you have not done all the previous tasks leading up to this. Take test. little bit more detail required of us before we start the test. And this, as I mentioned earlier, is the crucial point that determines where your certificate will be going. Firstly, you need to agree to the terms of use and then click on please select. What we're doing is we're selecting you, our provincial association. And here you will find the umpires associations all over South Africa. If you select Borland, your certificate will not come to training at wpcua.co.za. It will go to the head of training of Borland Umpires Association. I will not be notified that you have passed. I will not be able to forward you your certificate. If you click on border or Easterns or Eastern Province or any of these other associations, I will not receive your certificate. Please, guys, all of you, whether you're in Durban, whether you're in Johannesburg, whether you are in Stellenbosch, whether you're in Cape Town, whether you're in Mumbai, whether you're in Sydney, whether you're in the US, everybody needs to select Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. Why? So that 
their certificate comes to me. Now we're going to get interactive and I'm going to switch my camera on and I welcome all of you to switch your cameras on as well as we will be going through Cricket South Africa's introduction to umpiring course and we will be answering the 30 minute exam together. Uh, Abdullah, I'm going to ask you to fa facilitate. Uh, anyone who wants to answer a question should raise their virtual hand and help me to submit answers to the questions that we are about to see. So there's actually 35 questions in the Cricket South Africa Introduction to Umpiring exam and we have 30 minutes to complete it. And Abdullah, um, what I didn't mention earlier is that if you are repeating a um, an exam attempt or if you fail your first exam attempt, the second exam attempt will be the same 69 questions, but they will be in different order. So please don't be alarmed if you see that question one on your second attempt is not the same as question one on your first attempt. The questions have merely been reordered. So without any further ado, level this level of introduction to umpiring is only true or false questions. So again, let's read them carefully before we rush into an answer. First question is, umpires are the sole judges of fair and unfair play. And Abdullah would have gone through this in one of his first slides because it's in law two. Is this true or is this false? Abdullah, do we have any volunteer to help us answer this question, please? Uh, yes, Tom, the first hand that was raised is Dean. Dean, if you can unmute yourself, or if you want to switch on your camera, feel free to do so. Hi, good evening. Uh, that's true. That is true, Dean. Well done. The umpires are the sole judges of fair and unfair play. Only click on submit once for each question and you will see that it is working in the background. What it's doing is it is registering your answer so that when you submit for a final time after your 35th answer that it calculates your um, result. Uh, next question is, captains are responsible for the team's conduct, true or false? Now, because this is the introduction to umpiring exam, you won't find that all of the answers are in the revision slides that Abdullah presented earlier, because those revision slides are for level one exam. OK, so we might come to one or two questions that we're not sure of because they weren't revised this evening. Don't be alarmed. All the questions you'll find on the level one exam we have revised. Abdullah, do we have a volunteer for question two, please? True or false? Captains are responsible for the team's conduct. No, Tom, no volunteer so far. I think you yeah, we do to. have a volunteer. OK, great. Uh, we do have one. Sandeep, Sandeep, if you can unmute yourself and switch on your camera if you want to and give us the answer, please. Sandeep, are you there? We can't hear you. Uh, good evening. It is true. Yes, um, I believe that is true, Sandeep. Um, it is written in law one, if I'm not mistaken. L question number three, it is not against the spirit of the game to dispute an umpire's decision. That's a pretty straightforward one. It's in the spirit of cricket preamble to the laws. Abdullah, if we don't have a volunteer, you can uh, name anybody you want to name. And please, guys, 
Let's not be shy. Let's rather get these questions wrong now and make sure we get our level one answers on Friday correct. Any volunteers, Dula? Uh, Tom, um, I saw GB15, GB6153. If you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. GB6153. GB, we cannot hear you. Please unmute your mic. Okay. Abdullah, anybody else? Only other hand, I see um, Sandeep. I see your hand. Was that an old hand, or or you're able to answer this question, Sandeep? Okay. Um, there I see a new hand, and uh, Nagas Nakasiva. If you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Uh, it's false. Um, that is correct, Nagasiva. This is one of those tricky ones where it's a true or false and there's a negative in the question, uh, but you're quite right. It is against the spirit of the game to dispute an umpire's decision, so it is not would be false. Um, while that question has been submitted, I'm just going to close all my other windows uh, in the hope that it will speed up the processing of this particular website. Question number four, teams are allowed to distract opponents verbally. Uh, true or false, Abdullah? This is covered, I think, in Law 41. And remember that we have not covered Law 41 and we have not covered Law 42 because they are not examined in the Level 1 Cricket South Africa umpiring exam. Do we have a volunteer, Abdullah? Uh, yes, Tom, we do. Uh, Venkat, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Good evening, Irwin. Yeah, false. That is correct, Venkat. Uh, teams are not allowed to distract opponents verbally. Right, next question. A team can field with 12 players. This is covered in Law 1. Abdullah, do we have a volunteer to tell us whether this is true or false, please? Tom, I see GB6153's hands raised again. So if, if let's try again, GB, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer. Abdullah, maybe GB's microphone is not working. Uh, if that's okay. the case, GB, yes, I can hear you. If not, please type your answer into the chat box and uh, we can read it from there. It is false. It is false, correct. <laughs> Uh, the law limits the number of fielders to 11 at any point in time. Well done, GB. And we can see that the website is changing over quicker because I've closed all other internet using applications. So that's a point for you when you are attempting your exam is make sure that this is the only internet using application that you've got open on the day. Question six, umpires before the toss do not need to determine the times of play. So again, this is a negative statement. Is it true or is it false? Abdullah, do we have a volunteer to answer this one? Uh, uh, yes, Tom, I see, I see a new hand raised. They are um, older hands that answered questions already, but I've, I'll go to the new one. Uh, Tamil, Tamil, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Uh, thanks, Tom. And uh, Abdullah, it's false. That's correct. Uh, umpires do need to determine the times of play um, before the toss. So because that was a negative statement, we mark it false. Next question, Dula, and maybe what you can do is you can um, 
some users don't know how to lower their own hands, maybe you can lower their hands for them uh, so that we only see new hands for new questions. Question seven, the bowler's end umpire is to stand anywhere he or she feels comfortable. That's an interesting one. True or false? Do we have a volunteer for this one? It is uh, yes, false. Tom, uh, Greg, was, Greg was quick on the draw. So Greg, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. The answer is false. OK, the answer is false. I, I think that is the correct answer uh, because the law um, speaks about that the bowler is an umpire needs to be in a comfortable position uh, where he or she can make the decisions that he or she is required to do so um, and not be in the way of the bowler or distracting the striker. So like Abdullah said, if a statement is not 100% true, then you should mark it false. So I believe that's the case with this statement. Next question coming up a little bit slow again on my side. Question eight, dead ball signal is made by extending both arms horizontally. If you can see me, that is a dead ball signal, true or false? Abdullah, do we have any volunteer for that pretty simple true or false question? Uh, Edrich, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Well, uh, yes, that is uh, false. That is false. Uh, that signal obviously is for wide. And we know the signal for dead ball is something like that. Question nine, an umpire may signal four buys in one motion to the scorers. So four buys signaled in one motion to the scorers. Abdullah? Do we have a volunteer for that question, please? Uh, I'm hearing a, a correct answer. Um, please, if we can give everybody a chance by putting our hands up. And when we are not um, requested to answer, uh, please put yourself back on mute. Question 10. The pitch length is the same for all ages. True or false? Abdullah? Uh, Muhammad Irshad, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Uh, it's false, false. False is correct. Um, junior cricket does allow for uh, shorter pitch lengths. Question 11, a change of innings will be classified as an interval, true or false? Another straightforward question, Abdullah, any volunteers, please? Yeah, first hand raises Dean. Dean, if you can unmute yourself, please. Ah, uh, that will be true. Correct, Dean, there are four types of intervals and the change of innings is definitely one of them. Next question, question 12, and I like the speed at which we're going now. We've got 24 left, so still a way to go, but I'm sure we can make it in that time. Uh, the bowlers and umpires to call Play after any interval or interruption, true or false? Dula, volunteer, please. Yep, first hand up was Chetan. Chetan, unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Uh, good evening, sir. Yeah, it's, it is true. That is true. Thanks, Chetan. And our over rate is increasing quite nicely. Question mm -hmm. 13, a striker may set off for a run from in front of his or her popping crease. True or false? Do they need to go back into the popping crease to start the run? Abdullah, do we have an answer or a volunteer for... Yes, those? we do have a volunteer. Uh, John Gray, if 
you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. Pause. Uh, John, did you say false? Please uh, pause that yes. one through again. OK, so uh, think about David Miller, South African uh, middle order batter. He bats from outside of his crease. Uh, when he hits a ball, does he need to go back into his pop increase before he can run, or can he just uh, carry on running from where he's hit the ball? Okay, I'm going to mark it true because a striker can set off for a run from in front of the pop increase. Okay. Um, yeah, please check that one. It's in law 18 in your PDF laws that I sent. Next question, question 14. Umpires do not need to agree the boundaries with the captains. True or false? Abdullah, any volunteers? Uh, Tom, I don't see uh, any new names. Let's give it uh, one or two more seconds. I don't see new names, then we'll have to go with uh, Muhammad Irsad. His name was uh, raised first, Tom. Muhammad, if you can unmute yourself, please. Uh, true. Um, law 19 boundaries, Muhammad. The umpires do need to agree the boundaries with the captains. Okay. So. Yeah, false. It's a false. Sorry. Okay because that's a negative statement, I'm going to mark it false. And remember with the true or false statements, please read them carefully before answering, guys, because it's very easy to make a mistake by not seeing a negative word. If you read this as do, then you're going to answer incorrectly. Question 15, the ball becomes dead when it lodges in the clothing of an umpire. Law 21, dead ball. Abdullah, do we have a volunteer? True or false? Yes, Tom, uh, yes, Tom we do. Um, this is a number. I'm only going to read the, the first four digits. 3605, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. 3605. Three six zero five. I think it's I heard false. false, Tom. I did hear false, Abdullah. Um, the ball becomes dead when it lodges in the clothing of an umpire. I think that is true, actually, Abdullah. Um, no, no, no. What if, I'm saying is, did we? Did I hear false? I'm asking, did I hear false or was it? I, I did hear a false. I did hear a false. Okay. Um, 3605, please go revise law 21. Um, it is uh, dead. The ball becomes dead. Abdullah, let me not get confused here. The ball does become dead if it lodges in the clothing of an umpire. Yes, Tom. Thank you. Moving swiftly along, uh, we've used more than half the time. We haven't got through half of the questions yet, so a bowler may change his or her delivery mode without informing the umpire. We're looking at law 20, uh, sorry, law 21 is no ball, law 20 is, is dead ball. Um, so is this true or false? Do we have a volunteer, please, Dula? We have about seven volunteers, but the only new name that I'm seeing, Tom, is some Kelo. Samkelo, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please, Samkelo. False. That's correct. The bowler needs to inform the bowlers and umpire of changing his or her delivery mode. Otherwise, umpire will call no ball. Question 17. The bowler's back foot may touch the return crease on delivery. This is another low ball question. True or false? Do not any volunteers, please. 
We have four volunteers, but no new names. Let's give them two more seconds. If I don't see a new name, I'll go to the first hand that was raised. I don't see a new name. So, um, Edrich, if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer, please. It is false. That is correct, Edrich. If the back foot touches the return crease, all is in umpire to call and signal no ball. Question 18, the call of no ball shall override the call of wide. I think this is mentioned in law 21 as well. Um, Abdullah, any volunteers? True or false, please. Tom, I don't see any new names. Then I'll have to go to the first one that was raised, and that is Sandeep Kumar. Sandeep, can you unmute yourself and give us the answer, please? Maybe we can go to the next hand, Dula. Uh, GB6153, if you can unmute yourself again, please. GB6153. I think in the interest of If time. not, then the, yeah. uh, Dean, lastly, let's go. Dean, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, that will be true. That is true, yes. Abdullah, if you can just lower all the hands that are up so that we get uh, yeah. uh, fresh hands, even if it's um, mm. guys who've already answered questions, um, mm. for them to put up their hands again because then we know that they are still with us and are willing and able to answer question 19. An umpire is to call wide before the ball passes the striker's wicket. Abdullah did mention this in the revision earlier. Is this true or false? Any? It's more than 10. Yeah, the 10, about 10 hands. Tom, uh, Mornay, I saw your hand first. Mornay. Fantastic. Can, uh, I don't see uh, more name. Uh, Nagasiva, can you unmute yourself, please? It's false. Uh, false. Uh, we need to call and signal wide after the ball has passed the striker's wicket. Well done. Thank you. Question 20. A batter can be dismissed from a wide delivery. True or false? Dula, next volunteer, please. Uh, it, it's quite a few. I'm, I'm look, looking to see if I can see any new names. I, I don't see any new names. Yeah, first hand raise was Sandeep. Sandeep? Yes, it's true. That is true. Um, they are, are, if I'm not mistaken, three ways that a better can be dismissed off a wide. And uh, four ways, Tom. Four ways, correct. Thanks, Dula. There's three for Noble. Uh, we've hit uh, another error in the website. Let's see what happens if we refresh. And um, hopefully we haven't lost all our answers. No, we haven't. And our time is still ticking downwards. A leg buy can be scored if the batter did not attempt to play the ball. True or false? Dula, any volunteers, please? I don't see any new names. Uh, Tom, the first hand that was raised was Dean. No, that is false. That's correct. No runs to be awarded if there is no attempt at a shot. Question 22. Injured player may have a substitute at any time. True or false? Abdullah, any new volunteers or is it the Dean versus Sandeep uh, competition? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I don't see any new names. I only see two hands that are raised currently, and uh, Nagasiva, if you can unmute yourself, give us, give us the answer, please. Yeah, the answer is true. So the substitute can uh, come anytime when the player is injured. Perfect. Nagasiva, thank you. Good answer. And you are in the race with uh, Dean and uh, Sandeep. Question 23. A substitute may act as a wicket keeper. This is a new law introduced in 2017. Abdullah, true or false, please. Next volunteer. A Greg, you're number one. Your hand was raised first. That's true. That is true, yes. Uh, as long as the umpires allow, a substitute may act as a wicket keeper. Question 24 coming up. A fielder may return to the field without the consent of the umpire. True or false? Abdullah, any new hands? Uh, yes, Mr. Pinar. Mr. G.W. Pinar. And if you can unmute yourself, please. Uh, false. That's correct, uh, Mr. Pinar. I was hovering over the false, waiting in anticipation for your correct <laughs> answer. Question 25. A batter may retire at any time during his innings. True or false? Ula? No new names, but quickest on the draw was Nagasifa. Uh, it's true. That is true. As long as the ball is dead, a batter can retire at any time during his innings. We've got five minutes left to answer 10 questions. Let's see if we can get them all in. Unfortunately, my internet seems to be slowing down instead of speeding up. So please consider this when you are attempting your level one exam. You need to have a good internet connection and close all other internet using applications on your device. A few people have asked me if they can use their phone for the exam. Uh, in five years that we've been running the level one online exam, I only know of one person who has successfully registered, logged in and attempted and passed the level one exam. So I suggest using a computer or a tablet rather than a phone. Question 26, an umpire may give a better out without an appeal. True or false, Dula? I think you covered this last week, mm -hmm. Wednesday. Uh, Dean was quickest on the draw, Tom. Dino, if you can unmute yourself, no, it's please. False. Uh, it's false. It, that is false. Uh, there needs to be an appeal for an umpire to give a better out. Thanks, Dean. Question 27, also on law 31 appeals. An appeal covers all ways of being out. True or false? Abdullah, any volunteers? Yeah, six hands, but I see one new one. Mark Young. If you um, can unmute yourself, Marky. <laughs> Evening, guys. The answer is true. Hello, Mark. Evening, Mark. Well done. Thank you. On to the next question. Question 28. And my internet speed seems to be picking up again. A batter will not be given out if the ball touches an umpire. True or false? This is an interesting one. I don't think it was specifically covered in um, level one presentation. Abdullah, any volunteers, please? Yeah, um, quite a few, the usual suspects, but I do see a new name. Nirav, if you can unmute yourself, please. Nirav. Hi. Yes, hi, good evening, guys. The answer should be uh, false. A batsman can be given out if the ball touches an umpire. Correct, Nirav. Well, well read because I was actually had forgotten that this was a negative statement. Um, it is indeed false. 
moving swiftly along to question 29, or I hope we're moving swiftly along. Seems to be slowing down again. And it's actually a good thing if we see what happens when we run out of time, uh, because it can happen to you if you are taking too long to answer your 69 questions. The background computing will only submit the answers that you have submitted. And so us, for example, we will probably end up answering 30 questions. And if we get 29 of them correct, then it will be calculated as 29 out of 35. Let's see what that percentage is. It's 83%. So let's see if we can get to uh, question 29 and 30. Unfortunately, it seems to be jamming quite poorly. Um, this, I must say, is the lowest it's been in one of my demos, but let's move on. A batter may be given out leg before wicket if the ball pitches outside of the leg stump. Abdullah, you went through quite a few examples this evening. Should be an easy answer. Uh, any volunteers, please? About 10 of them, uh, Tom. Let me, I'm just checking if there are any new names. I don't see any new names. Quickest on the draw. Guess who? Nagasifa. Uh, false. False. The batter should not be given out if the ball pitches outside leg stump. Well done, Nagasifa. Question 30. Let's see if we can answer this one. The umpires must give the batter out leg before wicket if no shot is offered so doesn't matter where it's hit him doesn't matter where the ball is going we must give the batter out lbw if no shot is offered abdullah true or false please i do see a new name ruan if you can unmute yourself and give us the answer please ruan False is correct. Let's submit that one. And let's see if we can submit for 31 as well. We probably won't be able to. The umpire must only consider the first interception when answering an LBW appeal. Our time has expired, but I'm going to submit true. And let's see what happens. So the answer that you submit after the time expires is the last answer that will be taken into consideration when calculating the result. As you can see, we have a few not completed. There should be four of them. One, two, three, four, five not completed, because I think um, that 31 was submitted too late. Yeah. That's correct. You see, the umpire must only consider the first interception when answering LBW appeal because I submitted it after the time had expired. It is not accepted as an answer. So we attempted 30 out of 35. Let us see what our result is. And our result is out of 35 questions, even though we only answered 30. Um, if we got all 30 correct, then, like I said, we should get 80, um, 30 divided by 35. Oh, it actually gives me 86%. And our result is actually 80%. Why? Because we got a few wrong. Umpires before the toss don't need to determine the times of play. I'm not sure what we answered there, but it seems like we got it wrong somehow. And so this is quite useful for you. If you do not pass, then your result will be less than 80%. And then you will also see which questions you got wrong. In fact, I, I think if you don't pass, you don't get 
to see what you got correct and what you got incorrect. It's only if you pass that you have you receive the memorandum in a way. Um, so so yeah, you won't have any freebies in terms of uh, your second attempts, third attempts, fourth fourth attempts with uh, the the answers being given to you, or at least them telling you which you got right and which you got wrong. Um, just on subsequent attempts, uh, there are, like I said, 69 questions and you have up to 90 minutes to answer them. Um, 69 questions is quite a lot. Your brain will be frazzled after attempting to answer 69 questions, especially those true or false questions with negative statements. Those require clear thinking. So what I suggest to you is if you do not pass on your first attempt, do not try and attempt your second attempt immediately because you will be tired, you will be mentally drained, and you will now be panicking because you won't be sure which questions you got right and which questions you got wrong. So rather take a break and then um, a few hours later or even the next day, study the presentation that I'm going to send to you with the answers, just the revision slides, and then attempt the exam again. And if you felt like you did have a lot of time, then you can also consult that presentation as you're going through these questions and answers um, so that you are able to pass on your second attempt. If you fail all five attempts, there is an option to pay online 50 South African rands for another five attempts. However, I'm not sure if that option works. So what you need to do is you need to contact me and ask me if I can activate those five new attempts for you, which I can do as admin on this website. Um, but the payment, I don't know if that works correctly on here. And if it does work correctly, I don't know where the money goes to. So the best thing for you to do is to contact me asking for another five attempts and you will only need to pay 50 South African rands or let's make it three US dollars using the same payment method that you paid your initial exam fee for. OK, so don't use the payment method that comes up on the website. Um, I'm really not sure where that money goes to and if that payment method actually works. So now I'm going to show you that because I have passed and because I entered Western Province as my association before the exam, I will now see the certificate emailed to um, to training at wpcua.co.za and I will even show it to all of you so you see what the introduction to umpiring certificate looks like and there it has got my first name, middle name and surname because that is what I entered when I logged after I'd logged in and I was starting the process of the exam. OK, so now. I will then forward you your certificate as soon as I can and you will receive it. Along with details of level two, but you will then tell me when you are going where you are in the cricketing world and then the following Wednesday after the sorry Tuesday the 28th of 
March after the window period has closed, I will provide contact details of associations around the world for you to all try to join an umpire's association and start umpiring. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is all the logistics I needed to get through this evening. I thank you as I see there are proof of payments coming through all the time on training at wpcua.co.za. Um, I don't know if there are any further questions that I need to go through. Abdullah, I don't know if you have uh, checked the chat box for for any questions. I, oh, while problem. I was presenting, wasn't able to. Yes, please go ahead. Is that GB? No, it's Greg. Um, Greg. Sorry, I just uh, one concern that you were doing that exam now and question two there where the umpire needs to consult or the captains need to consult with the umpire for the boundaries. Mm. We answered that as false because the question was do not and mm. the umpire needs to consult with the captains at the beginning of the game. As the questions being reviewed to make sure that the answers we give are correct. Yeah, so Greg, um, this has been a challenge since the online exam was introduced. Um, the memorandum is not 100% correct, I have to be honest with you. Um, there are one or two answers which uh, we as umpires and trainers do not agree with, and we have asked Cricket South Africa to get Umpires Universe to update and correct the memorandum, but this has not been done, unfortunately. So, um, so yeah, that 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 is a perfect example of a memorandum answer being incorrect. Uh, but you do have the let's call it luxury of thirteen questions that you can get wrong in the level one exam and still pass. Um, I have seen guys get up to 96%. I have seen guys get up to 98%. I haven't myself gotten 100% simply because the memorandum is not 100% correct. So apologies in advance for that. It is a bit frustrating, especially if you get 79.8% and it uh, is not uh, rounded up to 80%. Um, but yeah, that's a system glitch that um, even through numerous uh, complaints from our side has not been corrected yet. Thank you. Are there any further questions, comments or uh, queries about the course or anything umpiring related? Um, I would just like to mention as well that when I send out the email tonight uh, with uh, all the course material and all the payment uh, details that I will also be attaching a course evaluation form, uh, which I kindly request that you all uh, fill in um, as honestly as you um, possibly can. Uh, this feedback helps us to improve our courses. Um, like I said, level two will be online and will start on the 1st of April. So we can use feedback from you on level one to improve on our level two course that's coming up. Uh, it won't affect the certificate that you get or it won't affect whether you become a member or not. Uh, so please be as honest as you uh, wish to be when submitting that evaluation form. It is only for us to improve on our courses, not for anything else. Um, so on that note, I'd like to thank you all for your uh, attendance uh, and interaction. Uh, Tom, be, before you end the session, there are one or two questions in the chat box, Tom. OK. Can, can I read them for you? One is one or two is admin and one or two the law related. I'll I'll answer the law related ones and okay. then the admin ones you can answer. Please go ahead, Dula. So Nagasifa from the Netherlands is asking about the the online test. Do we only have multiple choice and true or false type of questions? Or selecting multiple 
answers for one question, will that be asked? Uh, just please clarify. Uh, good question, Nagasiva. Um, it is only multiple choice or true or false questions. You do sometimes have, uh, let's say it's a multiple choice question and the options are A, B, C, D and E. You do sometimes have E being A and B, for example. So uh, that in a way would be selecting more than one of the answers, but you can only select A or B or C or D or E, not more than one. Uh, I hope that makes sense, Nagasiva, the way I've answered that question. Next one, Tom, from Real. What should the payment, what should the reference be for payment? Uh, the reference needs to be your name, Real, and level one, please. So make sure that when you make payment, you do not send the automatic proof of payment to training at wpcua.co.za. Uh, please rather send it to your email address and then from there forward it to training at wpcua.co.za. Why? Because I need your email address. If you just put Rael level one and that proof of payment is sent to training at wpcua.co.za directly from the bank to me, um, I won't know what your email address is because not everybody's name is in their email address. I need your email address to be able to send you the exam link email on Friday morning, 7 a.m. South African time. Next question, Dula. Uh, you're on mute, Abdullah. Uh, sorry, Tom. Um, last question for you. Uh, it's from Hank, all the way from Toronto, Canada. Hank, has done his level one and two at the Canadian Umpires Association in Toronto. He's asking, is it possible for him to do level three with us? The Cricket South Africa level three uh, exam. Hank. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Uh, good question, Hank. Um, no problem. You don't have to do level one with us. You don't have to do level two with us. Um, however, just to note that our mailbox or our mailing list for level two and level three is taken from the level one Cricket South Africa online exam website, which has got all the email addresses of everyone who has passed level one online with us. So as things stand, your email address is not in our mailing list because you didn't do level one with us. So do yourself a favor, put your email address in the chat box and that way I will add you manually to our mailing list for level two and level three and you can join us for level three uh, when it starts, uh, when exactly will level three starts? It depends on how many candidates we have for level two. So level two exams are going to be written in uh, early to mid May 2023. And if there are 20 candidates who we have to mark the papers of, then level three can start two weeks after the level two exams. But if there are 200 candidates that wrote level two and we need to mark those because those are not marked automatically online, it's a physically handwritten exam, scanned and emailed to uh, Abdullah and myself, and then we forward the emails and the answer sheets to Cricket South Africa umpires who uh, mark the exams. So if there are a lot of exam 
level two exams to mark, then level three will start maybe a month after the level two exam. So that will all be communicated to our level two and level three mailing list uh, in due course. I see Sarab has asked, is uh, Law 41 and Law 42 included in uh, Level 2 and 3? And the answer is Level Law 41 is covered in Laws uh, in Level 2 and Level 3. Uh, but Law 42, we don't really cover in any of our um, Level 1, 2 or 3 exams. As mentioned before, uh, there is a code of conduct for most, if not all, tournaments that take place across the world, and that code of conduct replaces Law 42. Um, so that's why we don't cover Law 42 in any of our courses. Um, law questions for you, Abdullah. Um, I haven't seen them, so you can go through them, please. Yeah, it's um, only one, uh, Tom. Um unless there are new ones that after this one is from Mark Young. So Mark, his question is, the scenario is the batter who took God outside the crease. It's an appeal for LBW. While the, the Polish in umpire is still deliberating the appeal, the slip fielder throws at the stumps at the uh, strikers in, breaking the stumps, while the batter is still at the ground. So Mark is asking, can that batter be out run out if they are not out LBW? Thanks for your question, uh, uh, Mark. So to answer your question, yes, Mark. The batter can still be out run out while the ball is still in play, while that ball is still alive, and the striker did not get any, get any part of the bat or person behind the popping crease when the wicket was put down. Yes, the striker can still be out run out. Even though a run was attempted or not, the run out will tell us while the ball is still in play, the striker needs to get either the bat or part of a person behind the popping crease while the ball is still in in play. So in your scenario, if the bowlers in umpire gives this, the striker out LBW, then the mode of this missile will be LBW. If the LBW appeal is turned down, then the striker will be given out run out. Tom, uh, over to you. That's all law questions I've seen. I'm not sure if there's any new ones or any other questions. Uh, I'll then end back over to you, Tom. Uh, no, nothing else has come in except uh, Hank giving me his email address to add him to the level two and three mailing list. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your participation and interaction over the last two and a half weeks. I want to wish you well in your level one exam, and I hope to see all of you at level two, starting the 1st of April, Saturday at, I think it's 9 a.m. South African time. Uh, those details will be sent to all level one passes in the week leading up to the start of the level two course. So once again, thank you very much uh, to all of you, including Abdullah and Mark for presenting. And I wish you all the best, not just for the exam, but for your umpiring careers. We shall see you at level two. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you and goodbye everyone. All the best for the exam. Bye everyone. Thanks Tom, thanks Abdullah. You're welcome.